Today we're going to talk about cell transport and how stuff moves into and out of the cells through the cell membrane. Okay, so there are two types of transport that we're going to discuss. The first type is passive transport. Okay, and in passive transport there is no energy required. And the second type is active transport. And for that type, you need to use energy. Okay, so in passive transport, substances move across the cell membrane with the concentration gradient. Substances move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. All right, so let's look at this diagram. We have lots of a particular substance on this side and we have very few on this side. So this is our high concentration. This right here is the cell membrane, and we want to move from high concentration to low concentration. So the question is, which direction are these um, substances or these molecules gonna move? Well, for the same, we're gonna move from high to low. So we're gonna go from this side to the other. Okay, this is also known as diffusion, okay? Um, in order for molecules to diffuse, a concentration gradient must exist. Concentration gradient is simply the difference of concentration between two regions. They must exist in order for the molecules to flow. All right, so uh, the concentration gradient has to go from high concentration to low concentration, or if you're using energy, it'll go from low to high. Um, example, when cookies are baking, they are releasing molecules into the air as the dough heats up. Over time, these molecules spread from the oven to other parts of the kitchen and eventually other parts of the house. Okay, you know that you can smell um, the cookies as they bake and you know when it's almost time to eat them because they smell so good and that's because the scent has diffused throughout the house. Okay, uh, molecules are able to naturally diffuse due to a mechanism called the Brownian movement and the Brownian movement is just simply the random movement of particles. Particles suspended in a gas or a liquid are bombarded by fast moving atoms or molecules. The rate of diffusion is going to decrease once equilibrium is reached. So what is equilibrium? That's the rate of diffusion. Uh, the net rate of diffusion is zero when equilibrium is reached. Equilibrium is the state in which the concentrations on both sides of the semipermeable membrane are the same or equal. Okay, so if this is our semipermeable membrane, when the amounts of particles on one side equal the other, then they're going to be at equilibrium. There are three types of passive transport that I'm gonna expect you to know. One of them is simple diffusion. Molecules simply diffuse through the semipermeable membrane without any aid of a transport protein. Things like carbon dioxide and oxygen are going to pass by simple diffusion, okay? Um, the other one is facilitated diffusion, and in facilitated diffusion, the substance of polar, the transport of polar substances or ions across the semipermeable membrane require transport proteins, so they have to be there. Ions, salts, potassiums, um, and last but not least, we have osmosis, and that is diffusion of water across a semipermeable membrane. Okay, so here we have it without transport proteins, with transport proteins, and then the transport of water. Okay, so let's get into what simple diffusion really is. It is passive, all right, so that means it requires no energy, um, no ATP is used. It does not require proteins. Those are the substances that are gonna be nonpolar and they have no charge. So they're just gonna go right on through 
like no big deal um, because actually they would be going this way. Um, we'd be going from high concentration to low concentration. These guys look to be at equilibrium, so if they're at equilibrium, they're not going to really move and definitely are going to go in that direction. Okay, we also have facilitated diffusion. Facilita facilitated diffusion is also passive. Um, it requires no energy to use ions and polar molecules in and out of the membrane, but it has to use proteins. Okay, proteins are needed to assist ions and polar molecules because the inner portion of, of the cell is nonpolar and it will resist any polar molecules trying to pass through. So these big circular chunks are your proteins and they take the um, polar molecules through because as soon as the polar molecule hits the inside of the cell membrane, it's nonpolar right there, and it's just going to want to spit it right out. So instead, they um, go through these carrier proteins, and it doesn't require any oxygen. Um, it doesn't require any energy, and it's easy peasy for them to get in and out. Okay, transport proteins. In uh, facilitated diffusion, um, there are two kinds. We have channel proteins, okay, and those are just simply tunnels that the molecules can enter and exit. It um, can be gated to open and close. And then we have carrier proteins, and those are proteins that will change their shape as they interact with a particular molecule and allowing them to pass through. All right, so let's take a look at this diagram right here. This is um, is the extracellular space. Okay, so extracellular tells you that is on the outside, and intracellular space that tells you it is on the inside. All right, so we're looking at the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, and this is our cell membrane. So we've got our hydro Billic head, hydrophobic tail, and these molecules right here, these guys want to come through, but they are polar. And since they are polar, they have to go through the, either the protein channel, if there's enough space, it'll go in, or if you notice these guys right here are too big, so they can't fit there. Instead, they take a carrier protein and it's open, it allows it to go in, it kind of locks it and then it spits it out. And um, it's like um, an assembly line. It just goes in, opens, close, in, open, close. Something else that we have are called ion channels. And these are special channels that are used in passive transport. Um, ion channels allow the ions to come in and out of the cell with the concentration gradient. So they're going from high concentration to low concentration. And um, the ion examples are Na+, which is sodium. Okay, so sodium. K+, which is potassium. And then Cl-, which is chloride chlorine, but Cl- is the ion chloride. And they have to go through these little channels here, and only if they are in the right position will they allow them to open and close and go through. Now, osmosis is the diffusion of water, and it only will al allow water to pass through. It moves from high to low. That is every single passive transport is going to move from high to low concentration across the semi-permeable membrane, okay? So looking right here, you have a cell. This is your semi-permeable membrane. So it's your cell membrane. 
you have your high solute concentration here and your low solute concentration there. Moving from high to low, the high concentration um, molecules are going to want to go into the lower one. So we move from high to low all the time. All right, so test question. Let's look at these diagrams and let's determine which one best re represents the molecules that are moving through osmosis. So the first thing we have to look for is a semi-permeable membrane. And I do not see that with C and I do not see one in D. So we know it's either going to be A or B. All right. Um, now we're looking for osmosis so osmosis is water okay so let's just remind ourselves that we are looking for water that is going to be moving from high to low okay and it doesn't have to be going in this direction it could also be um, going the opposite direction so high to low. So looking at A, we see that the bigger molecule is sugar, the little one is water. It's got a semi-permeable membrane and water is moving across. We can check B just to be on the safe side, but it says that sugar is moving across and that tells us that A is our answer. Despite water's polarity, it can sneak through the cell membrane because of its size. It's small enough that its polarity is not even strong enough for the cell membrane to repel it. So that's something that um, you need to keep in mind. That doesn't happen often just with water. Okay, so now we need to talk about different environments that will happen within the cell. Um, if there is too much water in the cell, then it is said to be hypotonic and the cell will burst if the environment remains hypotonic. A percentage of the water is higher outside than inside the cell. If there's too little water in the cell, then the cell is hypertonic. Okay, the cell will shrink if it is exposed to a hypertonic environment and the percentage of water is lower outside than inside. And finally, a cell environment where the concentration of water is equal inside and outside of the cell is called isotonic. And that's the ideal environment for our cell. Okay, so let's go into some detail about a hypertonic cell. A cell in a hypertonic solution is, um, is said to be in a hypertonic solution if the concentration of water inside the cell is higher than the concentration outside the cell. Okay, so water is going to diffuse from high to low. So if it's higher inside than it is outside, water is going to leave the cell. And when it does that, it's going to shrink. Okay, so in a hypertonic solution, the cell shrinks and put in parentheses, this is not on your notes, so you need to write it down, plasmolysis. Okay, P-L-A-S-M-O-L-Y-S-I-S, -S, plasmolysis. Okay, this is why you should never drink salt water. When you do that, you're going to severely dehydrate yourself because all of the water in your cell is going to leave um, because you have all this water inside your cells and hardly any on the outside. So high to low, goodbye water, hello dehydration. Okay, the total opposite of hypertonic is um, a hypotonic solution. And a cell is in a hypotonic solution if the concentration of water inside the cell is lower than the concentration outside the cell. And what's gonna happen here is um, because water diffuses from high to low, water is going to go into the cell and your cell is going to burst. Okay, cell will burst, and there is a special term for that as well. Uh, you need to write this down. It is cytolysis, okay? Cytolysis is when your cell 
explodes. And that is bad, obviously. Isotonic solutions are where the water concentration stays equal inside and outside of the cell and water goes in and water goes out of the cell at equal rates. There is no net movement. Um, the cell is in equilibrium and that is exactly what we want. All right, so let's do a little bit of a review here. Uh, nothing for you to write down, but let's see if we know these answers. So what transport port does not require energy? You said passive, you are correct. Active transport does require this, it requires energy. During passive transport, substances move from blank to blank concentrations. If you said from high to low, you are correct. Blank is the diffusion of water. If you said osmosis, you are correct. Blank solutions could cause a cell to burst. Just remember there is, um, it's either hyper, H-Y-P-E-R, or hypo, H-Y-P-O. And which one of those looks like it could swell? Hypo, hypo, hypotonic solutions can cause a cell to burst. Facilitated diffusion uses transport blank to transport substances into or out of the cell. If you said proteins, you are correct. And ion channels are proteins that allow blank to pass through the cell membrane. Well, the answer is inside the, the term itself. It allows ions to pass through. All right, congratulations. You have finished your notes on passive transport, and now we need to move on to active transport. And we said that with passive transport, we do not need a uh, we do not need energy for the cell to go from high to low concentration. Things will move without energy, but in active transport, that requires cells uh, to transport things across the membrane going against the concentration gradient. So now we're going from low to high, or it's used to move really large particles, large molecules that don't fit through the membranes um, or the transport proteins. So they have to have energy. And ATP is our energy currency. Okay, so we have some examples of active transport right here. We're gonna talk about these in a bit of detail. One of them is called endocytosis. One of them is called exocytosis. And then we have a sodium potassium pump. And as you can imagine, it's going to be dealing with just sodium and potassium. Okay, so check yourself. Active transport requires the use of energy. Molecules that are actively transported are going to go against the concentration gradient. So we are speaking low to high. All right, so we are moving backwards. It's like going um, against the tide. You're swimming in the opposite direction. You're, you're either doing that going low to high or because the molecules are really big. All right, endocytosis is a process in which cells surround and engulf the substances that are too big to enter the cell. Okay, so if they're too big, they are going to use uh, their own membrane to engulf the substances into a vesicle and bring it in. Okay, so. We said there are three kinds of active transport and there are three types of endocytosis. One is called phagocytosis, and that is when you take in solid food particles. One is called pinocytosis, and that's when you take in dissolved or broken down substances. And then the other is receptor mediated, and that's when the cell brings in a specific substance uh, using receptors like hormones and proteins. So looking at your picture here, this one is phagocytosis. As you can see, you have a solid particle and your plasma membrane is going to turn into like legs, basically that's what this pseudopodium is. And then it goes all the way around and creates this phagosome, which is a food vacuole. That's not a word you have to know right now. 
pinocytosis is when you have something really, really small and it just kind of pinches together and then it forms a small vesicle down here. And then receptor mediated endocytosis is when there's a receptor on the cell membrane and it grabs a hold of something and then it just kind of curls into a ball and it pinches off just like you have right here. Okay, exocytosis, as you can imagine, is the exact opposite, opposite of endocytosis. And that's when a cell forms a vesicle around an unwanted particle and it's gonna expel it out of the cell. So if endocytosis brings it into the cell, exocytosis takes it out of the cell. So let's look at the two here. In endocytosis, something wants to come into the cell. It forms a vacuole. The cell membrane kind of pitches or swallows it, and then it brings it in. In exocytosis, we have this something, the vesicle that has been created, and we want to get rid of it. So the cell plasma membrane is going to push it out. So endo means in, exo means out, cyto means cell, so endocytosis brings it into the cell, exocytosis brings it out of the cell. Okay, let's talk about the sodium potassium pump. Um, it's a specialized protein, it uses a specialized protein that's going to pump three sodium ions Na plus out of the cell for every two potassium ions K plus that move into the cell and it moves sodium against the concentration gradient so we're going from low concentration to high concentration now i want you to look at this animation here uh, this right here is your protein and as you can see what happens is two potassium come from inside the cell and they leave when um, it shifts and it drops the potassium, the phosphorus from the ATP. And now a new potassium goes in and we have three sodium that wanna move out. And this just happens over and over and over and over again. So for this to take place, you have to use, you use one ATP every time this pump takes place. So we have three sodium that are going out of the cell and two potassium that are coming in the cell. Okay, sodium plays a key role in generating electrical signals in our neurons. So we have sodium potassium pumps um, in our nerve cells. If sodium builds up in our cells, it's going to cause them to malfunction and that can be fatal. Uh, it's very, very bad. So sodium is constantly sneaking back into our cells after it is pumped out. And how is it able to do that? Well, it's able to do that thanks to ion channels of passive transport. It allows them to diffuse back into the cell because it's going with the concentration gradient. So that's something that we have to you have to consider. All right, uh, let's do a quick check here and let's see what exactly we uh, can remember. For osmosis, it is passive and does it require energy? If you said no, you are correct. Endocytosis is active and if you said it does not it does require energy you are correct ion channels are passive and they do not require energy facilitated diffusion is also passive so it does not require energy exocytosis is active so it does require energy and finally the sodium potassium pump is active so it does require energy and that's all you need to know about cell transport.